to the cloud. Welcome everyone to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the second installment of Art Gottlieb's lecture on the 20th Century by Decade Part Two. I would like to take a moment and thank our sponsor for this program, the Friends of the Library. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Art Gottlieb. Thank you very much. So I have a slideshow for you today. And um, this way it'll give us some visual cues about some of the things we'll be talking about. Uh, the 1960s, just as a uh, just as a preview, is something that is different than the other sessions we've done uh, in our in our ongoing series, um, because this is the first decade where I actually have any recollection, uh, and so I'm I'm looking at it from a standpoint not just of something historical that I've you know studied. Uh, but something that I actually have a point of view about because I was alive during the time. I mean, albeit at a very young age, you know, I was born one day before 1958, you know, so I can't say that I had a lot of cognizance, you know, in the first few years there. Um, but I'm very excited about this. I'm going to turn my, uh, I'm going to share screen now and let's see if we can get to this. Just a minute. There we go. Can you all see Don F. Kennedy? I just need a verification from somebody. Yes? All right. So our decade starts off with um, the, our photograph here of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, of course, and this is the way. This is the way I see the 1960s. I, I say, you know, how do you start something like this? And for me, um, historically, and once again with my own personal recollection, um, the, the decade starts with this man right here, 1960, and he, he replaced. Uh, relatively speaking, an elderly person. And that, of course, was D Dwight David Eisenhower. And it's the famous passing of the torch to a new generation of Americans, as was said in his inaugural address, John F. Kennedy's, that is. Uh, and it was it was true. It was the first time you had a president who was born in this century, meaning the 20th century, of course. And that had a lot of significance to it, right? Um, you know, tempered by war, you know, tested by a long and difficult peace. And so if you were 40 years old or something in 1960, you had a World War II veteran, quite possibly a Korean War veteran. And now you were ready for what uh, a good term for this would be a kind of peace dividend. It was like this sweet spot right before Vietnam became Vietnam as uh, as we knew it in an escalated war. Um, and it was John F. Kennedy and Camelot, you know, this era of promise. We're in this world now where there exists thermonuclear weapons. The Soviet Union is has missiles um, targeting our major cities. And uh, we've got ballistic missile submarines around and, you know, soon there was going to be the Cuban Missile Crisis, et cetera. But this is where my thoughts go. My first recollection, really, one of my earliest remembrances, uh, and it was just kind of like this visual of uh, my mother sitting on the corner of the bed crying upon the news that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. That's one of my earliest recollections. <clears throat> so here's a nice black and white shot of JFK and Jacqueline visiting Texas on that fateful day. <clears throat> 
uh, November 22nd, 1963. And the famous pink dress. In my mind, this is what shaped the decade. And there was a lot of things that were gonna happen in the 1960s, but the way it started is not the way the decade ended and started off with this promise, with this hope, with the Peace Corps, with this, this notion that, um, this idealistic notion that the United States was going to prevent wars and be a place where discussions could happen between nations to prevent armed conflict. And I think that his assassination was a bit of a metaphor, um, not to overstate it philosophically. But I think that our country was in a state of grief over this in a number of ways, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And of course, others were to follow, as you, as you know. Now, for me also, um, the 1960s was marked by John F. Kennedy's goal of the nation, stated in another speech that he had, that the United States was going to make it their priority to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. Now, you know, perhaps, perhaps this was an act of we've got to absolutely make this happen and, and to remember John F. Kennedy. And if John F. Kennedy didn't get assassinated, maybe if we didn't make this thing happen until, I don't know, 1970, 71, that might not have been a deal breaker. But I think that to keep John F. Kennedy's memory alive, um, that maybe we pushed ourselves a little harder to reach a goal of landing a man on the moon in 1969. And that's not something I could substantiate with fact. It's really just my opinion, right? But as a young man in elementary school, right? In elementary school, the first grade, second grade, third grade, and first, second, and third grade, I mean, this was a, one of the early shaping memories that I had was like them stopping class in school and then they would bring us up into one room wherever it was and they would have this tv set on a stand which to me was the biggest tv set i ever saw right and it was probably all of like i don't know like 27 inches across or something like that and uh and then we would watch these early launches of the mercury and gemini capsules and it was it was you know i was bursting with pride you know, as, as a young American, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, you know, with the smoke coming out and we have launched a person into orbit. It was a great source of pride for me. Uh, and somebody of my age, you know, I mean, I don't know if this is universally the case, but certainly my father had been proud of his service in World War II and during the Korean era in, in uniform. And it was a period of time where the United States had not been sullied by this notion that our actions weren't noble uh, in our geopolitics or our military um, actions, right? And that certainly was going to change. In, in a very short amount of time, certainly before the end of the 1960s, right? But right now it was a sweet spot of America is good, the Soviet Union is, you know, all of the things that they were. And I'm sure that their young people would be taught the exact opposite about us with the, certain, with the same certainty. And um, this was another thing that marked the 1960s, uh, which was so pronounced that they were them and we were us. And we were morally superior. Um, and, and that gave us a sense of cohesiveness, certainly at the beginning of the, uh, of the decade, um, and a sense of identity 
you know, and those sorts of things. I mention that now because a lot of that doesn't exist anymore, you know. But I'm old enough to remember it, you know, whether it was true or not or whether it, it should have been the way I was raised or not. It's, it is a fact that that was something that was a, bit, a deep impression on me. John Glenn. Good movies to watch regarding some of this stuff, right? The Right Stuff, if you've never seen that, I really recommend it. It's well done. It really is well done. The right stuff. And uh, also, um, I like Apollo 13, right? Which I've probably seen. You know, my wife comes into the room. I'm watching Apollo 13. She says, how many times have you seen that? I said, I don't know. Probably 15 times. She goes, why are you watching it again? I says, well, I, I missed this part. So anyway, John Glenn, of course. I'm sure you have your own memories of this. Time Magazine, Space Races Go. And so many things had shaped our society at that time based on the space race. Um, we had packaged foods of certain kinds that, you know, you knew that this technology was being used because the astronauts have had to have something to eat. Uh, do you remember Tang? The drink tang, that green, that, uh, no, orange stuff, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know if I, I, I don't remember if I like tang or not, but what the hell, the astronauts were drinking it. So, and then you had other processed foods and things um, because it was considered very modern. And um, now, of course, people my age or slightly older than me, baby boomers, um, I'm a very young baby boomer, but they kind of rebelled against that and went into like this holistic kind of lifestyle as a result of the processing agents that were used in foods and of course, artificial ingredients, right? Artificial dyes, et cetera, right? So there were a lot of people, even when I was very young, who were turning complete naturopaths, you know, and they didn't want anything artificial put in there. They didn't want fillings in their teeth because it contained who knows what, and that was going to change your energy level in your body. And, you know, for all I know, that might be true, but that's not my specialty. Um, yeah, Spaceman Glenn. And there's John F. Kennedy, of course, and John Glenn looking at the then recovered Friendship 7, you know, when it was a big deal. I don't know if you've ever looked inside one of these things. Uh, you know, when I was working at um, in the in the um, historical aerospace industry, um, you know, I got to see a lot of artifacts like this. You can might imagine what it would have been like to be a the, the uh, in the in this capsule by yourself. And it just adds to this sort of other level bravery. You know, so we have to ask ourselves also in, in our time now, which is a long time from when this happened, I mean, what kind of heroes do we have? And I mean, who's a hero today? A, used, a YouTube personality or a, a social media influencer? I mean, who are our heroes? <clears throat> Another, this is a great story, by the way. It would, it would warrant its own presentation. Do you know who the person on the right is? I'll bet you some of you do. I mean, I do. Because, because from even from my World War II Europe history, um, this is Werner von Braun. And Werner von Braun is our guy, right? Now, what happened well, here was Werner von Braun used to be uh, working for the Nazis. And the Germans had um, the Germans had developed all of these these very, very modern cutting edge technologies. It was very scary, the Germans in World War II, because they kept coming up with new stuff. The Germans came up with the first cruise missile. They came up with the first intercontinental ballistic missile. And um, they were coming out with new technology submarines and quite a few other surprises. You know, it was very, very important to defeat the Germans. 
uh, before they were able to technologically turn around um, what was a lost cause um, by that point, by 1945. And Werner von Braun was up in the Baltic, right on the edge there, in a place called Pinamunde, right, which was being staffed by God knows who uh, all of these conscripted laborers and, you know, slaves, really, um, slave labor. And, but Werner von Braun, it's an interesting story because, you know, we look at this guy and say, what, wasn't this guy a Nazi? You know, and yeah, he was a Nazi, but it was, it's, it's hard to scrub the Nazi off of somebody, but if there was an effort to scrub the Nazi off of somebody, this is the best example there ever was, right? We scrubbed the Nazi off of this guy to make him the hero of the space program, you see? And he was the one who developed the V1 and the V2 rockets. And um, so therefore he was the rocket guy. And I would like to think, even though I don't know this, I would like to think that Werner von Braun was really just a guy who loved rockets, right? Like our guy, um, Goddard. And and he was at the wrong time in the wrong place where the Nazis were in power. And the Nazis came to him and they say, listen, you either build rockets for us or you're going to be breaking rocks, right? In God knows where, you know? And he just took it upon himself to do the best he could to build rockets, but unfortunately, it was for the Nazis. And, you know, I'm not exonerating him. Um, but people who were smart as he was in the beginning of 1941, uh, 45, I'm sorry, they knew the war was lost. And so when the Allies, the Western Allies, were coming from France, the British and the Americans and the Canadians and the Russians were coming from the East, right? Both converging on Germany. Somebody like Werner von Braun, who knew that he was going to be grabbed by either the Russians or the Western allies, the British or the Americans. And he gave himself a choice. Who do I want to be working for building rockets for the next 30 years? Right. Cause that's what they're going to do with me. They, they want, the Nazi rocket te technology. And Werner von Braun made sure that he was captured by the Americans, right? He literally set it up so that he was captured by the Americans and not the Russians. And we did indeed grab him. And as I said to you, we uh, disinfected the Nazi off of him to whatever degree that's possible. And he became as American as apple pie. Uh, in he was the one who developed our all of our early rockets, including the Saturn V rocket, which took our astronauts uh, eventually to the moon. See, here's Werner von Braun. Right, notice that he's not actually wearing a, his Nazi uniform. I, maybe he had one somewhere. Who the hell knows? You know. Uh, it, it's difficult for me to to put a positive spin on anyone who's wearing the the swastika. You know, it just is. But there he is. And uh, he's getting priority of funding from the Nazis. And um, there he is with all of these Nazi officers. Um, and that, of course, is in 1945. And he makes it to the cover of Time magazine. Now, that's an Atlas rocket behind him. And that was his rocket. Um, and this was a real space race. It was an arms race is what it was. A heavy duty arms race between the Soviet Union and us. And the Russians had actually got the first successful leg up on us because in 1957, they put up uh, this little gadget called Sputnik, right? Which literally terrified anybody who had any sense because it wasn't that this little shiny thing was flying around up there. It was the first artificial moon, they called it. The first thing in orbit. It meant quite definitively that the Russians and whatever Russian scientists that they grabbed 
uh, I mean, German scientists that the Russians had grabbed had actually developed the navigation system to and the mathematical skill and the technical skill to be able to launch a rocket and put it into a very precise orbit, which is not an easy thing to do. And if they could do that, which obviously they can, then that means that instead of Sputnik being up there, they could put a miniaturized warhead up there and precisely put that miniature warhead anywhere they want it. And that means that they would launch it from the Soviet Union, from Siberia, over the North Pole, over Canada, to one of our sites in the United States. You see, they really were be ahead of us. They really were. And it scared the hell out of every. It's one of the reasons why John F. Kennedy had won, amongst other reasons, um, the 1960 election, uh, because one of the campaign promises of, not cam campaign points, talking points, of the Kennedy uh, campaign was that the previous administration, the Eisenhower slash Nixon administration, had dropped the ball and allowed the Soviets to get ahead of us. They called it the missile gap, that Eisenhower and Nixon had allowed there to be a missile gap and that the Soviet Union was ahead of us, you know, suggesting incompetence. Missile Man Von Braun. Now, until we started getting rockets that were actually operating, we were trying to send some things up really quickly after Sputnik. And our rockets were, they were taking off and they were making it like a thousand feet in the air and exploding or falling back to the earth and then exploding. I mean, it was pretty embarrassing. You know, fast forward, as far as the space program is concerned, I wonder how many of you remember this. Of course, I was always interested in stuff as a young man, not to say that women weren't, but, um, you know, I used to build like models and things of airplanes and rocket ships. And I used to like to build stuff like that. So I was into it. 1967, um, in the new, the latest rocket, which was going to be the Gemini, uh, not the Gemini capsule, rather the Apollo capsule, which had three passengers. Now, that was the one that was going to be taking our folks to the moon. Um, and there were three guys in there who got burned in a flash fry. And it was, it was an unbelievable tragedy. 1967. Do you remember this? Astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee, you know? And so you had a question here. It's like, what should we do? Should we discontinue the program? Are we going to, you know, make good on Kennedy's promise before the end of the decade of landing a man on the moon? You know, so they fixed whatever problems they had with the cockpit. There's a scene on this about um, in, in Apollo 13, you know, where, you know, the young man is, you know, was asking his dad who's going to the moon, you know, you remember those guys in Apollo, uh, in the earlier Apollo test where they were incinerated. And, uh, you know, it was still something on everyone's mind, the kind of dangers involved here. You know, it's another thing that made heroes out of these people was that, you know, I mean, rockets blow up. Corrections were made, and this is now Apollo 11, right? And you have the landing of Neil Armstrong and who was a Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And um, there is a Saturn V rocket, you know, and if you're not impressed by this or this didn't inspire you, it certainly did me. You know, this was still a time where bigger was better. If you remember automobiles. And, you know, the cars were like, you know, the longer it was and the more heavy it was, you know, and the longer the hood was, right, the bet, you know, the richer you were or something. And, um, you know, so this was one damn big rocket. 
and certainly the most powerful thrust that had ever been applied to the for, to the surface of the earth to push something into orbit you know and of course it was a three stage thing you know the first section of the saturn 5 dropped away then you had the second portion kick in and that was in orbit and um and it was a whole operation this is werner von braun's design by the way now where were you when the moon landing occurred and if you were watching it on television, right? I mean, I guess you would be. You weren't watching it on your on your smartphone, were you? You know, I was down in my, I don't know, my grandmother's house down in 20 miles outside of Trenton. Uh, so we had, you know, with rabbit ears. Remember rabbit ears on the TV, right? And you had to turn it and, well, you know. But we we got the best signal from a Philadelphia station. So with some Philadelphia station, we were watching this. And it was just unbelievable. It was it was surreal. It kind of still is surreal, you know. Um, and Neil Armstrong, photo uh, Apollo Eleven astronaut Buzz Aldrin, right, photographed by Neil Armstrong. At the Sea of Tranquility moon on the moon in what was that July, right? 1969. It's just unbelievable. It's a long time ago. I understand there are some people that don't think that this really happened or that it was, you know, something that was staged by the government. I'm not going to get into any of that. You know. So, but wow. You know, and if one thing went wrong with these guys, they were like gone forever. That was it. It's about as hostile environment as you can get. Very cool. Ah. Now, besides that stuff with the space program, I think for me, the biggest impression of the 1960s was cultural. And one of the biggest, um, the biggest events that happened was about music, right? And... Um, you probably remember this. Um, I don't remember this particular scene personally, right? Where the Beatles are arriving on that 707. Well, I guess it was at JFK. And uh, it was a big deal. It was, it was the beginning of like what became to be known as the British invasion. And it was this whole kind of a cultural thing. Right. Where the United States was the United States. And we were probably you know, the leader in this and the leader in that. Yet at the same time, you had the British who would actually kind of become the forefront nation that was producing these incredible artists, right? Here are the Beatles, as you can see. And um, they're here they are arriving at John F. Kennedy uh, International Airport. I mean, I remember watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, right? I remember that, that part I remember sitting on the floor watching, looking at this on our black and white TV, the Beatles. And do you remember the girls swooning and it just passing out with, you know, screaming at the top of their lungs? Um, I mean, that was a real social phenomenon. Um, if you stop and you remember. You know, and John here, by the way, John here was married. You know that? And it was, you know, the powers that would be that were controlling the marketing uh, money machine that became the Beatles. They insisted that he didn't wear a wedding ring and essentially hide the fact that he was married because simply put, he was more marketable. And so were the Beatles. If women or young girls could have the fantasy that they were all available, you see. Which was another thing about the 1960s, the commercialization, the wanton commercialization of literally everything. Um, you th I think of, you know, Colonel Parker comes to mind. 
you know, of of Elvis Presley and and what was being done to actors and actresses. You know, not that that happened in the 1960s solely, but I'm thinking of Judy Garland, et cetera, and how it, you know, it was the money and the machine that came first. And whether or not you drop dead from taking too many uppers or downers seemed to be a secondary consideration, did it not? Look how young they are. So I guess Paul McCartney and Ringo are the still the surviving members. Ah, this is what I remember. Except I didn't see it in color, you know. Deb, when are we going to get a color TV? When this one breaks. Now, even at my age, I knew that this TV, the Philco, or whatever the hell it was, was never going to break. It just it was never going to break. It was indestructible. It was never going to break. You know, I mean, if it started getting fuzzy, you'd go back there and figure out which tube wasn't lit and you get another tube and stick it in there and be good for another 10 years. Right. And um, anyway, uh, this was a big deal. It was beautiful. It was wonderful music. It's like the Beatles music always seemed perfect to me. You know, those melodies and everything else like that. It was it was just awesome. And not only that, but it was the sound of a new generation. Um, one of the, the largest things that I recall from the 1960s, and, and it was it was something that I witnessed, not personally from myself, but because my brother was old enough, more old than me. He was five years older than me. Right. So my brother was in a, a more advanced class of baby boomer than I was. And he was more in direct confrontation with the values of my father, particularly. You know, where it's you had this notion of uh, there was a lot of like, well, that's not music, you know, and, you know, those kids need to get a haircut. You know, there's a lot of that going on, you see. And so for kids who wanted to be rebellious, well, this was a first class ticket to rebellion was starting to wear your hair long or starting to, you know, play rock and roll music or when you had that stiff music teacher telling you that this is what music is and this is the way you have to play it, you know, you look at these guys, the Beatles who have no formal musical training and you say, well, look at them, isn't that music? And then of course the old timers would say, well, no, it isn't. Music has to follow these rules. So for me, the 1960s represented this kind of rebellion of, of kind of like this, everything that everyone's telling you, it has to be this way. And it created a, a generation of people who pushed back and say, no, why does it have to be that way? You see? Now, I want you to notice something else about the Beatles, right? Because they're representative of the point I'm making. Is that everybody started off in the 1960s, in the early days, dressed impeccably, right? I mean, they had their Beatles haircuts and all the rest of that. But everything is groomed well and they're wearing these matching suits you know and especially it one of the things that separated the british thing from the american thing was the british they they had this kind of um this overstated well maybe it wasn't overstated but it was deliberate tailored around what they would do right in other words their suits were well tailored it's like savile row Right. I remember in a James Bond movie, where do you get your suits? Well, Savile Row. And, you know, it was impeccable tailoring. And that was giving the British a sense of something that they had qualitatively over the nation that had surpassed them and influenced the United States. Right. The place where mass produced things came from. And the lack of quality came from, whereas Great Britain still trying to, you know, it was a big slap to Great Britain at the end of World War II. And this is the immediate post after World War II, still here in, you know, the early 1960s. You know, Great Britain was the leading nation in the Western world in 1939. By 1945, the United States had surpassed Britain and France, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of the older European nations, they, they looked at us as the, the young kid who really didn't deserve to be as rich as we were or as influential as we were. 
you know, so this was a way that Great Britain could express themselves, you know, it, to bring back their own sense of, well, at least we have the qualitative factor, you know. Yeah, you remember him. Oh, my God. Sorry for my laugh there. But Ed Sullivan. I saw that I was introduced to the entire world on Ed Sullivan. Everything, everybody. Ed Sullivan, you know, the, you know, the epitome of like the, you know, the stiff, the stiff, like old generation white guy, I guess. Right. And. Um, we're going to have a really good show tonight. Right, I can't do the accent. Mm, who do we have here? That's right. That's Mick Jagger in the middle. You see what I mean? I mean, when you see it in a picture, you can you can't almost believe it. It's you know, unless you remember this, you know. I was too young to actually remember this, but these guys started off the deck needing to be acceptable right and they're all wearing these nice jackets with the little velvet thing around the back whatever it is and of course Mick Jagger has got to be you know the outlaw that he is because he's holding a cigarette in the picture right and everybody's got their like night look at those shoes and don't they look good you know so they got their kind of like um their outlaw haircuts but it's all well groomed So the way that the 1960s ends is a lot different than the way it began. Oh. Bond. James Bond. Right? The first movie I ever went to. I think it was Thunderball. I think. Maybe it was Thunderbolt or Goldfinger. I don't remember. And my parents made my older brother drag his little brother with him, right? Poor guy. Probably why he hates me now. No, he doesn't hate me now. But it's uh, like, geez, can you put together a more handsome together dude than this? Right? I mean, it's like, you know, the guy had it all. He had the women. He had the car. He had, he, he was a better poker player than anyone on earth. He could beat the hell out of you i mean he was irreverent you know he he was the best you know he was just the best right and of course he was british and mi6 007 you know this represented a lot of things for a lot of people in the 1960s certainly to me Sorry for the cat meowing in the background. Ugh. Remember this? I had this poster. I had this album, right? It is Sgt. Pepper's, right? And the whole Lonely Hearts Club band. You got to hand it to the Beatles and their promoters, right? And um, it was just incredible what they came up with. You know, the thing is with the Beatles is they became so successful that they didn't have to do what some marketing company told them that they had to do. They could literally innovate and do what they wanted, you see. And so they just did what they wanted because they had become so successful that they had that freedom. Um, so, of course, the Beatles, it, to my mind, the Beatles gave our this time frame a kind of a kind of path where everybody wanted to emulate it. Right. By this time over here, you got the Beatles, their hair is longer, you know, by I guess this was 1967, and more people had been taking LSD and they would, you know, people were smoking pop and all the rest of this sort of thing and um, recreational drugs and looking for a different kinds of experiences that were, you know, people were using the euphemisms or rather the rationalizations that, well, you know, if I take LSD, it's going to give me that kind of creative thing that I was looking for that you can't find when you're just, 
I don't know, not stoned, right? And uh, so it created a complete counterculture, right? That was representative uh, by by people who were emulating this kind of behavior. And I'm not saying it's aberrant behavior. Um, I certainly this was the this was the formative things that I looked at when I was a young man. And uh, when I became somebody who was old enough as a teenager to kind of do what I want, you know, 16, 17 years old, it was the mid 1970s. And so so people like me were taking advantage of the kind of um, libertine attitudes where people who were older than me in the 1960s had broken the door down, you see? It wasn't me who broke the door down. People who were a little older than me broke the door down of the conventionalisms and the 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 normality of you know having uh, casual sex and things like that. You know, by the time I was a young man, a young teenager, uh, you know, 16, 17 years old, I mean, it was you know you wanted to sleep with somebody who slept with them. You know, it didn't mean that you had to marry them. Um, and that was something that, you know, was just it was easier for me than it was for the for the people 10 years older than me or even five years older than me who really still had to fight their parents. You know, this cultural dam had already been broken. And, um, you know, to my mind in the 1970s, it was taken to a level of excess. But, you know, that's something that every person who's growing up has to navigate. Remember this whole thing? I mean, there was all of this. Remember, like, who, uh, who was the walrus and all the rest of that stuff? And and if you played the music backwards, right? I mean, the, the record backwards, there was some, supposed to be some message and you didn't hear it. But after you smoked three joints, then you started hearing it. You know, it's just, um, you know what I'm talking about if you remember this the way I remember it. Right? And And feature films. You know, it's uh, I went to this movie with another guy when I was just a kid in 1967, which meant that I was nine years old. Right. And um, now I don't remember if that's when it came out, but in 1967, I was nine years old. And and they, they, the theater was so packed that the only place to sit was in the front row. And I think that I, I think that I ruined my eyesight forever sitting in the front row watching this animated film you know look at them it's incredible now as far as americans are concerned right you had the american guys you see and the american guys i think were best represented you know in as far as popular music was concerned by these guys the beach boys you know, and their image, right? And this was all fabricated, of course, was, you know, these guys who were running around on the beach taking advantage of this, you know, these kind of like this beach culture represented in, you know, these silly movies that they had in the early 60s, like with Annette Funicello and um, what was the name of that guy? Frankie Avalon, I think, right? And, you know, so we were supposed to be in an era here now where we were so carefree, you know, that um, the World War II is over, the Korean War is over. And it's like we, we're just going to just kind of revel in in our success as a nation and our bounty in the plentiful nature of the fact that there was full employment and we had enough money to pay off any kind of deficit spending. You know, it was a lot of confidence in the United States in the early 1960s because we still had our industrial base completely intact. Um, after World War II, 15 years after World War II, um, into the 1960s, I mean, you know, a RCA TV was still an RCA TV, right? A Chevrolet was still a Chevrolet. A Ford was still a Ford. Right. Uh, our aircraft companies were still our air aircraft companies. You know, the European ha Union hadn't gotten uh, up and running as a competitor to the United States competitively. Um, there was no such thing as Airbus. Right. So if you were going to fly an airliner, it was going to be a Boeing. If it ain't Boeing, I'm not going. Right. I don't know if you've ever heard that 
uh, I wonder what those people would have thought about some of the recent events about Boeing. And, um, you know, but it was like this kind of national identity and these kids fit into it. I'm calling them kids. I don't even know how old they are. But, you know, clearly Brian Wilson was a highly gifted person. Uh, really, he was. And, you know, and there was a lot of stories about him and his experimenting with drugs and uh, whether or not that helped or hurt, I'm not going to say, you know, ditto that for later on other artists like the Doors, et cetera. Um, but people who were into that scene, you know, were convinced that it was making them more creative. I don't know if that was the drugs talking or it was a rationalization or it really did open up new horizons. I mean, that's above my pay grade to try and figure out, frankly. But it is an interesting and a philosophical point, idealistic point, like. I wonder, but these guys over here, I mean, they were the clean cut kids, weren't they? Right. Americans, you know, they're just clean, good, having fun, confident. Right. Of course they were certainly Brian Wilson had his issues. Right. But you know, that was all covered up. That was the era of, it was like the era of phoniness in a way, you know, and of course I'm in the field of psychology now. So I look at things like this, you know, and it was something that people in, successive um reaction to this phoniness we're trying for a level of authenticity which caught up with the end of the decade by the end of the decade you had like a reaction to the phoniness of all of this um yeah here we go yeah so you have all of these antics and everything else like that Right. And of course, television culture tried to emulate all of this. Right. You think these guys would have thought of doing this themselves? You know, the, the production, like the kind of production people around Elvis and around the Beach Boys and around the Beatles, you know, were pushing them to do stuff, and pushing them to do stuff. And now you have to put out another record and it has to be this kind of record. And we need a, a line of uh, bobbleheaded things. And we've got to have uh, like accessories. And it was very Disney. You see now, you know, using the Beatles as an example, because I think they're just the best example, right? By 1967, 1968, the whole world is different. The whole world is different, right? And it was started with the example of the Beatles, in my opinion. I mean, in this cultural regard anyway, you know, and um, and I'm influenced by my own memories of this. Like I started our program telling you this is the first time I could tell you that, you know, I really I, I was kind of like here, at least from my vantage point. You know, I remember the effect that this had not only on it, everything. Uh, but also, you know, the arguments that my older brother had with my father. And it's kind of like, you know, it was like this thing that they used to call the generation gap, if you remember that. And, um, you know, you can see George Harrison here. Like, you know, really cool cat. And, you know, he's got long hair now and he's got the beard and people are experimenting. They, what's another thing that's happened here that was a very cultural, big cultural marker was that starting with the Beatles, um, there was a, a rejection of the certainty of Western values, right? As epitomized by, by uh, the Ten Commandments, biblical Judeo-Christian structure, right? So, the Beatles had gone and, you know, the next thing you know, they're hanging out with, you know, Eastern religion, right? And you had, there was this big thing and it was, it started with the Beatles and the Beatles were wearing like these Indian style clothing and they're looking into Buddhism and Hinduism and other things. And it really changed the entire structure of the Western world from the standpoint of the, what I'm going to call the younger generation, you know, and I believe that is, that is the example that the Beatles set, you know, like all of a sudden, you know, if you were born into a traditional Episcopalian family, 
you know, that was cast aside for all of these alternative kind of belief systems. And it was the Beatles, uh, once again, like I say, from my standpoint, it was the Beatles who actually normalized, you know, casting aside what was just a given by your parents that you were going to be kind of carrying on traditionally. And you were going to literally say, no, that's not right for me. I'm, you know, I'm a Buddhist now, you see. And um, and I think that that's one of the most significant cultural shifts that we've ever had. You know, and you had like a cleaner version of music a little bit. You know, and here's a picture of Elvis with his mom, who I understand he was, you know, just one of these situations. He really doted on his mom, um, you know, and, and he. Elvis was another example of. From one standpoint, what it meant to be a young American person, right, like pre Vietnam, you know, you got called up, you went and you served. Right. The people who went initially who were in who were in the military in the late 1950s, you know, Elvis, of course, served in Germany. Um, you know, essentially between, you know, with that Cold War aspect of things going on between the what was considered to be ground zero, the front between communism and and Western and Western values. Um, right there in Germany, if there was going to be a war and the Russians were going to break out, it was going to it was going to be from East Germany across that border. So, we, of course, we had a lot of people stationed in Germany. And uh, but Elvis was and many people who not that he was in Vietnam, but a lot of people who were. Around who were young people. Were raised in the tradition that America was good. And that America was noble. And what my father fought for in World War II and in Korea, by the way, was noble. So that anything we're going to be called up to do is going to be noble. And I don't want to be the one to to sully my father's legacy by being an embarrassment, by saying I don't want to go. You know, it's going to be part of the tradition. So it was really Vietnam that broke the back of this. You know, and Elvis, you know, you know, for whatever it's worth, I mean, it, it's, I always thought that he would have been, I would have loved to see Elvis just, just travel some positive path of just making music, you know. My fantasy is that he wasn't addicted to drugs and all the rest of that, which is kind of like a Judy Garland kind of a story. I mean, he was on uppers and then he was on downers and then he was on uppers and then he was on downers and Colonel Parker, who was, you know, less than honorable in my viewpoint. I mean, you know, these people were just fodder. They were just nails to a carpenter. You know, I mean, it's like if you dropped a few, it didn't matter. The only thing built was the house that you were done with. And Elvis, in other words, was expendable. And so were other people, you know, and so was the music. And it's you just it was how much money can we make? How famous can we get? How many products can we sell? It was so commercialized. It was so phony that I think that at least, like I said, from my standpoint, there was an entire reaction to the artificiality that became of it. Music. Man, the music was so good in the 1960s. I loved, even as a child, I loved the music of the 1960s. Remember these two, Ike and Tina Turner? I mean, that was hot stuff. I mean, he turned out to be kind of a, I don't know, be unfair to say that he was a prick, right? Can we use that word? Well, I just did. You know, I mean, so, you know, she was essentially exploited by him, et cetera. But fortunately, she finally got away from the guy, you know. I can Tina turn, right? Here's the I can Tina. I think it was called the I can Tina Turner Review. I don't remember. Here they are a little bit later. This is probably from the 1970s, judging from the looks of it. And, um, you know, but what a powerhouse. 
she was. What a powerhouse she was. Rolling on the river. You know, I remember listening to all of this stuff, you know, when I was driving around with my older brother had his own car. Right. right? So he had his car when I was when he was like, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, which made me like 13 years old or something like that. And I just remember that, you know, I remember the vinyl seats, right? The vinyl bench seat and the music on the AM radio, right? You had those five push button things. I remember a time we were driving along. It was five separate stations, right? All New York stations, right? And um, every five stations, right? Every All five different stations at the same moment that I was pressing those buttons, every one of them was playing a Beatles song. Every one of them, five different stations were playing a Beatles song. That's how incredible the Beatles were. And then, of course, Motown and Black Pride and everything else that was coming up during that era. You know, certainly this is also the era of, of um, you know, this kind of Black Pride identity awakening, right, which is something that really deserves its own series. Um, I hope we maybe we can do that. You know, the difference between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and and other um, and other notable people, right? Look at that picture of Tina Turner in 1970. I mean, she was like dynamite in a bottle, this lady. She just passed away. I think here's a picture of her that I have. Oh, I thought I had another picture. I'm sorry. Here we go. Tina Turner, born Anna Mae Bullock, right? And she passed away last year, about a year ago. Died May 24th, 2023. Right. Uh, born November 26, 1939, as Anna Mae Bullock. Right. And, you know, here's another. I love this music. The Crystals, Ronettes, right? Phil Spector, all the rest of that. To me, this was like the golden age of this stuff. You know, I'm like I'm like an old person who wants to listen to old stuff. Mary Wells. Bye bye, baby. Remember that? Bye bye, baby. This is the Motown review when Motown went on tour, right? The original release date, 1960. Absolutely fabulous. Ah. Television, right? Television in the 60s and the early 70s. But it was, you know, between. Between the Ed Sullivan show and Carol Burnett, right? It was just, it was the whole world. It was the whole world. It's like the internet for me. You know, it's like where you got to see Kay Smith and these other people singing, and, you know, and entertainment and all the rest of that. I remember seeing Elvis on TV on the Ed Sullivan show. I watched Elvis Presley and I thought that the television was broken. Because the black half of the bottom half of the screen was blacked out, right? Which is something I never saw before that or since, frankly. And I was like, I was asking my father, hey, I think that one of the tubes went bad, right? And, you know, they didn't think I was old enough to understand why the bottom half of TV was blacked out to the censors put that in, of course, to block the immorality of Elvis's gyrating hips. And, uh, you know, and they were right. I don't think I would have understood it at that point. Um, you know, things have changed quite a bit as far as what's available for the average person to see uh, on television or certainly elsewhere. But Carol Burnett, what I liked about this stuff was, you know, this was still in the tradition of something that's long gone now, right? <laughs> in the digital world that we're in. Is was that you had people who traced their origins, some of them back to vaudeville, or at least the the essence of vaudeville, which meant that it was a live performance and the show had to go on. And if you forgot a line, you improvised with something else. Or if you started to laugh, you had to suck it up somehow and you had to actually act. You know, and um, I, I used to love this. It was Harvey Corman. 
and what was the other guy's name? Tim Conway. And the two of them used to try to make each other crack up on, on, on live TV. And it was hilarious to watch. It was just funny. And there was no vulgarity. There was no special effects. There was no political hammering of a, of a person or a candidate or, or somebody holding office. It was just entertainment. And I think people my age, I don't want to wax too, you know, um, too reminiscent here, but it's, it, it is kind of like what happened to them, you know? Yeah. I think this is what, what happened to my brain, by the way. I, I think this is where my brain took a wrong turn and, and it affected me for the rest of my life was watching Gilligan Island all the time, right? Gilligan Island and all the rest of these stupid shows that was just I loved. I mean, you know what? That was what was on TV, of course. You know, it wasn't like I was saying, ah, oh, yeah, I think I'll go and, you know, stream something off of Netflix. You know, it wasn't like that. I mean, it's like if it was on TV or it wasn't on TV, you know, if I wanted to learn something, if it wasn't in the encyclopedia, then I actually had to drag my ass all the way up to the library. You see, and it was a long time ago. And um, but Gilligan's Island, you know, that was the kind of zany stuff that people my age used to watch. Um, and um, my wife's better at it than I am. My wife, it, whatever jingle of any of these shows, right, Gilligan's Island or I don't know, um, I Love Lucy, I Dream of Jeannie or all the rest of these things. She knows that she could recite the jingle of every one of these shows. They all had their own song, right? The Munsters, right? The Monkeys, they all had their own song and their own, you know, shtick, you know? And this thing over here, it's so, it's so crazy. It's so unlikely. It's like these people are like, they're lost on this island, right? But meanwhile, every episode, their clothes are like perfectly pressed and washed, you know, and all the rest of the zany stuff. Yeah, in retrospect, I'm not sure it hurt me that bad. <laughs> oh, just sit back, right back, and hear a tale. <laughs> a tale of a faithful trip. Oh, my God. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Oh, yeah. Something else I watched all the time, right? You know, this created culture. It created culture. It created counterculture, you know? Um, so here's a televised version of some ripoff of, you know, I don't know, the Beach Boys or the Beatles or some such thing, right? You know, long hair and and all the rest of these guys. And they're, it, it's a situation comedy, right? And they would throw a couple of songs in, you know? And I forget who was writing the songs. I remember watching a documentary once about the guy who was writing the songs. I forgot who it was. It wasn't Phil Spector. I don't remember. But these guys actually thought that they were real musicians, you know, and and other people said, what are you talking about? You're just actors and we handed you the songs and maybe you can play a guitar, but it doesn't make you Mozart, you know. Well, that's another thing. But, you know, all of the zany things these guys were up to and everything. But to me, the biggest force was the beat. You know, if you ever saw the movie A Hard Day's Night, uh, it's very, very indicative. And some of those other Beatles movies, you know, you had on some train in Great Britain, you had John Lennon sitting there and you had this guy who was older. Right. And, you know, God knows how old he was, 45 or something. He was really over the hill and this old British guy and and John Lennon. And they were all speaking very irreverently, no manners, no anything. Right. They were the new generation. And um, this guy looked looked at John Lennon, the older guy, and he says, I fought the war for you, right? Right, which is a real statement. It's like, you know, I fought and risked my life to keep our style of living and, I don't know, Western culture intact. And John Lennon said to him, he says, I don't care. You see, right there, I don't care what you did, what you think you sacrificed for me. I didn't ask you to do it. That kind of embodied a whole attitude that was to take over. And it kind of broke the back of culture in a way that was never broken before. Not this way. 
Oh, yeah. So this was always, to me, kind of like this counter theme to rock and roll, right? Because by this time, you had a lot of rock and roll, you know? And you had these guys who were very harmonious. And I don't have to tell you what their music was like. You either like it or you don't. You probably like it, like me. And it was it was a different thing. It was kind of, you know, wasn't really pop, you know? It was it was it was kind of like melodic and beautiful and thoughtful and all the rest of that stuff and um simon and garfunkel right so that was a whole nother theme in the 1960s you know and we're coming into the point where you know i was coming into more of a cognizance of things right now and this was very attractive if you remember you know, like Woodstock and the thereabouts of Woodstock um, or the essence of Woodstock. I mean, this was a pretty big deal for young people. And it was it was kind of like this feeling as though we as young people have exceeded the requirements and the limitations that the expectations that were put on our parents had. Right. We don't have to do that. We can do what we want. We can have long hair. We can take recreational drugs. We can, we can, you know, change the world and be different than, you know, our parents who were involved in um, um, geopolitical events where maybe we didn't have to be. In. Now, by this time over here, we already had Vietnam right, which had completely changed, right? And so we started off in 44, uh, 64, 65, and Lyndon Maynes Johnson did something called incrementalism, right? Right, this sort of like, we're just gonna keep adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff to Vietnam. And because we're the United States of America and we have the technology and we have the industrial base and we have the logistical means to do it, but there was never really a plan in Vietnam. And um, the Vietnamese knew that they were going to lose 10 persons to every one person that uh, American that they killed. But they just knew because they had the, the ideological advantage of knowing what they were fighting for. You say uh, the United States' goal was just to fight them. You say we didn't have an ideological goal. It was just in resistance to them. And we weren't there to win. And this whole thing created this, fed into the counterculture. And the counterculture was like, we're not doing this. You know, we're not doing this. You know, and maybe the communists aren't so bad. Or why are we dying? You know, and, and, and of course, this is a larger subject where communists knew, and strategists knew, and the North Vietnamese knew that, you know, the longer this went on, then if if public support waned for fighting Vietnam, then essentially that our politicians wanting to be reelected would re, would withdraw their support for the war. And then the war would not be funded and the war would have to stop and therefore they would win. So it was really just a point of attrition of waiting for the Americans to get sick of this and say, we're not doing this anymore. And quite frankly, every single war since Vietnam has been like that, uh, with the exception of the first Persian Gulf War, which was done, which was the first real United States intervention into something. And we deliberately designed it to be a an antidote for what people thought went wrong in, world, in the Vietnam War, right? That deserves its own presentation, quite frankly. You see, but here... You know, I remember my older brother fighting with my father and and it was a, um, you know, because he was liable to get drafted. And my, my parents wanted to make sure he got into college, whether he wanted to go or not, because they didn't want, you know, nobody thinks that their son should die. And, you know, you got to go to college, you know. And uh, and then my brother was like, he liked to fly. My brother had a pilot's license, actually. You know, but he had this very strong thing in his head that he didn't, if he joined the military, he had, had this moral thing where he thought that he did not want to go and bomb civilians, is as he put it. 
You see, that's just the way my brother put it. He says, I don't want to, I don't want to use my flying skills and go and it's not that he didn't want to fly a fighter jet. He didn't want to bomb civilians, you see? So, and there were plenty of people who felt that way. So, um, you know, but, but to say it in those terms actually has a larger implication that what we were doing was unjust. And you hear similar rhetoric, I mean, right at this moment, of course, obviously. And, um, you know, so this was the first time this has really happened in our country, this this schism, this notion that maybe we're not so normal after all, and maybe we're misguided, and maybe we're just doing something because we don't know how to get out of it, and it's, it's involved with our ego, or as Eisenhower warned, the, the military-industrial complex needs to constantly have this war to grind, and everybody else is just fodder in, in those expenditures. You know, this is really where it started over here. This left a tremendous impression on everybody during that age, certainly me as a formative young person. You know, right over here during this time, I, mean, I was I remember being in um, junior high school, you know, and where, you know, people might be talking about the things that young people might be talking about. It's not what we were talking about, not the boys. Anyway, the boys were like every one of us was certain we were going to get drafted. And it was, it was because this was, remember, this was the war that wasn't ended. There was no end in sight, right? That's another thing that we've already had in the wake of Afghanistan. We already have this notion of like, oh, what was that, 20 years? But before Afghanistan, the war that wouldn't end was Vietnam. And uh, because, you know, even World War II, we were done with World War II. The United States was effectively involved from 1942 to 1945. That's three years, three and a half years. You see, in Vietnam, we were there for, I mean, essentially until we got out, till 1975. And, you know, so that represented the war that had no end back in those days, you see. So, you know, people my age, at, at a young, even as a, as a young teenager, as a 12, 13 year old, it was like, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to Canada. Right. And that had a lot of implications. I mean, that was like a real betrayal of your country back in them and in, in those days. And um, and uh, well, for me, I was going to join the Navy, you see, because, you know, the North Vietnamese didn't have a Navy and I was going to carry on this tradition. My father was in the Navy, whatever. But all of us were forced to think about this, you know. Now, as far as people like in this era, you know, we had a lot of hippies. Right. And uh, hippies was a whole nother phenomenon that I remember. And in the early 1970s, in the mid 1970s, when I was of dating age, right, you know, after I was like, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, frankly, there were still there were plenty of women around that were that were inspired by this age and were hippies, you know, and they were, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with bodily hair and and we're going to wear, you know, we don't have to wear a brassiere and. And we're going to dress like, and I loved it. And I thought it was great. I really did. I mean, I was like a kid in the candy store. I mean, God forgive me, but it was, it was a nice time to be 17 years old, you know? And, um, you know, it's kind of like you want to have sex with people. You can have sex with people. I was actually a lot less promiscuous than I actually started off thinking I was, you know, because I started seeing the effects of free sex and it wasn't good. You know, it was a lot of broken hearts, a lot of it was too free, you know, and I had already that was in context of my as a young man, seeing my father's infidelities and the effects that it had on my my family and my mother. You know, so I always had a little bit more of a of a cognizance of the, the consequences of this sort of a thing, you know. Right. So there's this kind of, you know, this big pushback on this whole like capitalist structure, you know, and people are flirting with, you know, other forms of religion and government and saying, you know, it's is is everything about capitalism is everything about just making more money is everything about being phony to the point where it's like you just have to make money at all times. And um, there was a tremendous kind of pushback against keeping up with the Joneses and watching your parents 
parents, you know, they had to get a bigger car because the people across the street got a bigger car, you know, if that was seemed to be the case. And the more affluent you were, the more that seemed to be the case, because these kids, it was like the revolt of the affluent in a sense, you know. And um, so certainly it was a goal uh, to become self-sufficient and have a nice house and have things. I mean, after all, the same people who probably achieved that at this point were people who remember being in the Great Depression, you see. But younger generation just is reacting to this constant strive for material goods, artificial ingredients, um, consumerism, and phoniness. I wonder if you remember this like I do. I think, you know, I remember it so clearly. Remember all of this? You know, you had the National Guard coming out. You know, and if you've ever watched Animal House, you know, of course, it's it's a it's a it's a derisive mockery on the ROTC guys played by Kevin Bacon. Yes, sir. May I have another, you know, just kind of like these mindless drones just doing what they're told, you know. And then, you know, as 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 contrasted by, you know, these freewheeling thinking for themselves people in in their slovenliness are genuine. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Assassinated in 1968. What was it? Memphis, Tennessee. I just gave a uh, this um, every year during Black History Month. You know, I run certain speeches and I do things, of course, on Martin Luther King. I just did one this year on... Um, on the uh, not the I have a dream speech that was on on the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. This was the I may not get there with you speech. Right. And uh, that was that was the the night before he was assassinated. And of course. Robert F. Kennedy. What was the name of that guy? Sirhan, Sirhan, I think it was. Was that correct? You know, and there he is. And he's, you remember that Linda Maines Johnson said that he was not going to, um, he would not run for president. He would not accept the nomination of his party for president, you know, because he was done. The guy was toast. He was not politically toast, although that might have been true. I mean, he had had it. Vietnam had ground up Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 1960s, right? LBJ, it's another another fascinating question about the 1960s, is if John F. Kennedy had not been assassinated, let's say, for instance, that John F. Kennedy remained alive and continued his second term, um, what Vietnam and the decade would have looked like, right? You know, somebody like JFK, because he was assassinated, we, we've sort of frozen him in this magical place at his best, right? Whereas other people get older and they screw things up and they get older and they become less handsome and all the rest of that stuff. And, you know, John F. Kennedy is left in our mind is, you know, is, is in Camelot, you know, with Jackie and with all of the promise therein. And it was before the Vietnam had really taken off. Of course, it, you know, we were sending them all kinds of aid before that. But it was it was a long way away. It was on the other side of the world. And it seemed justified, frankly, because hadn't we done the same exact thing in Korea? Right. So if we did it in Korea and we're saying that that was noble, if you're saying that, that was noble, then what is the difference here in Vietnam? Right. We're helping the South Vietnamese defend their nation against North Vietnamese aggression, right? So it started off, you know, the same exact way. And and popularity was really there for our monetary intervention with the military equipment we were sending South Vietnam, the money, um, the advisors, right? 
you know, there's a lot of parallels to this era to some of the things that are going on in the world, even to this day. And it was polling very well. Americans said that we support this effort. So what happened after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Lyndon Baines Johnson takes over. And Lyndon Baines Johnson wants to, his he really, you know, Vietnam really isn't his thing. Lyndon Maines Johnson wants to, to to burnish his legacy, creating the. Um, I know I just kind of put a judgment on it, but I'm sorry, that's the way I feel. He he wanted to create what we call now the Great Society, right? So he was going to do something that was polling well for the American people to get more political clout for himself, so he can use that domestically to create his domestic policies and have them be pushed through. Right. Civil rights legislation, et cetera, um, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera, and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, so Vietnam for LBJ was a sideshow. And it became obviously his Frankenstein. Right. Because he just like I said, he just incrementalized. He incrementalized, you see. And, and sadly, we wound up making the same similar mistakes in 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 the recent past right up to the present, some would say, uh, where it's kind of like the question is, what exactly is our goal in this military policy? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to win? If we're not trying to win, then what are we trying to do, right? Are we trying just to hold off the other guy and wait till he runs out of bullets? What if he doesn't run out of bullets? What if the other guy raises the stakes and then we wind up raising the stakes and it just becomes this kind of blind stumbling and then, you know, psychosocially, what happens after you've had an investment in something is you can't just turn around and say, you know what, I know we invested something in this for years, but we've decided it's a bad idea and we're going to pull out. Not Nobody wants to do that because that means you're wrong and nobody wants to be wrong. So you have to now justify why you keep doing this. And then you wind up now lying in addition to adding in. And that was the end. And I wonder if it's not the same thing in some other stuff, right? Where the lesson was learned, not learned. And we're just repeating the same mistakes, right? And this is some of the discussions we have of our own day. Cats are mousing. Their favorite toys are these little toy mouse. And they walk back and forth. I don't know what it is with cats. It's like when they've got a mouse in their mouth. They they meow to like announce that, hey, look, I've got a mouse or look, dad, I brought you a present and you know, whatever it is. It's kind of cool, especially when I'm doing a Zoom presentation. So Robert F. Kennedy, of course, now we have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Right. And uh, but, you know, here is the young, handsome, one of the three brothers. And and he was, of course, what, the AG, right, for John F. Kennedy, really the only person that John F. Kennedy actually trusted. And here in 1968, he's like, I'm going to be the alternative, right? And uh, so he comes in, and of course, he's assassinated. You know, so the decade is, is, is rife with the kind of tragedy. Oh, yeah, remember this? You know, you had a lot of brown, great groundbreaking stuff. And there's two reasons why I stuck this in here. I'm running out of that time. I got to go a little faster. And, uh, you know, obviously the graduate. What was it? Anne Bancroft, right? And Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman is like this young kid and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And he's, you know, in this kind of affluence. And these people have all become jaded. You know, they're all jaded. They've got money. They don't, but they're, nobody's happy. And Andy Bancroft, you know, I'm an alcoholic, don't you? Right. And, you know, the famous scene in The Graduate, of course, is when the guy comes up to Dustin Hoffman and he says, well, what are you going to do now, son, now that now that you're a graduate? And he says, well, I'm not really sure. He says, plastics, plastics. And it really represents the decade right there. You got the young people who were supposed to be thinking for themselves. And maybe I don't want to do what you did as an older person. Right. You know, but and the plastics, that one word represented the celluloid fake nature 
that was the aspiration that people who were rebelling in the 60s were rebelling against. The idea that you would just go into some business and, you know, it was the up and coming business and it didn't matter what it was or what the product created. That didn't matter. The only thing that mattered is that you would have a job for 30 years. They were going to give you a gold watch at the end and you were going to get rich. Right. And then you can go and you can, uh, you know, your wife can become an alcoholic, too, and you can stay in Manhattan and screw your secretary. You see what I mean? And that's just life. You see? And so to me, this movie is very important because it represents what the rebellion was about, what the cultural revolution was about in this regard was this rebellion against the plastic. It's perfect because it's phony, right? It's an artificial material. See? Plastic. <laughs> I wonder if you remember this like I remember it. The graduate. You know, it was also groundbreaking too because it was this, you know, it was this this relationship, you know, obviously a extramarital relationship and just wanton casual sex and all the rest of that. Right. You know, and I was telling you about Carol Burnett before and how I loved her. And it was just live TV with talented people. No vulgarity, no political commentary, no nothing. It was just good stuff to my mind. You know, and here's another thing. If we look at law enforcement today and all the rest of that, you know, I grew up watching this sort of a thing. And, you know, Jack Webb was, you know, kind of a genius in this genre of creating shows, you know, Dragnet and Adam 12, where the world was changing in the 1960s. And these guys here who were probably, I don't know, both Korean war veterans or something like that, were like shaking their heads at these hippies and the drug culture and, and the kind of like the, the fact that society seemed to be sliding completely off of a cliff. And they weren't professional I don't know. They, they they were just regular people who were cops, you know, when it was a regular job, kind of like newspaper reporters who were just regular people. They weren't professional people who were the industry for 50 years. They didn't go to college and get a Ph.D. in something. They didn't call themselves journalists. They were just gumshoes. Perry Mason. Right. Honor, integrity smarts, the certainness that the law would be something that was equal, no matter who you were. You were going to be treated, if you were rich or not, differently. The law was the great equalizer and was always going to be consistent. It was like God that was always going to be there. It was not relative. Walter Cronkite finally representing something that was that had changed. It was Walter Cronkite who was the first one who kind of cracked in his television reporting and said, I'm not sure if Vietnam is something that we should still be doing. Right. It was really like one of the first examples of somebody who really revered and seemed to be even handed to actually add something now which is now the, the only problem, which is opinion journalism, right? It starts off now, not with here's what happened and I'm gonna leave my feelings out of it. Now all you have is essentially an editorial, right? And it used to be that editorials were left for the editorial page. Now the regular newspaper is an editorial wrapped in hard news. It is not. It is an editorial. And that is something that changed in the 1960s, right? Back in these days over here, all of the news programs I watched when I was a kid, it was like serious people and they were serious. And they were like, here's what happened. You decide, right? Remember Huntley Brinkley and of course, Walter Cronkite. I met him once, you know, and, and um, he was, he was serious. I mean, today you tune into any broadcast is kind of like info entertainment. You know, and it's always got to be the sexual banter between the male guy and the female. And, you know, they're like half of it's joking around before they even get to anything. Now, the world has changed quite a bit. 
Now I could do this for another hour like that, but we are out of time. I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Yep, it is. So um, let me close this. I hope you enjoy that as much as I did. I look forward to seeing you next time. Right, it's 3.30, what do you know? <laughs> Well, thank you so much again, Art, for your time. Uh, before we go, does anyone have any quick questions they would like to ask Art about today's um, session? Okay. Right. Um, well, again, you can always reach out to me um, on email or over the phone, um, and I can relay the messages or questions to Art. Uh, if that's something that you would like to have done. I want to just let you know that our next session will be on April 3rd at 2 p.m. Uh, if you missed any of the previous sessions, uh, they are available on our YouTube page. Thank you, Art, again for your time, and thank you, everyone, for coming, and we will all see you very soon. Bye -bye thank now. you very much. Bye-bye.